Um, a few things just to get started. I'm very, very new to this. I feel like I need my children in here to explain technology to me. Um, so let me know if you can't hear me or you can't see me or something weird like that because I have really have no idea what I'm doing. Um, technology scares me a little bit, but you know, this is the world in which we live now. So um, let me tell, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about myself and I, I totally get that this is weird because we are on um, the screen and it's, we're not in a room together. And I've done probably, over the years, I've done probably 80 of these um, writing and editing workshops around the state at libraries. And then I also lecture a lot at writing conferences and workshops and stuff like that. I've been to the Blackstone Library twice already and had really good experiences both times I was there. So that's fantastic. Um, the, I find that the best way that these lectures run is to really make them interactive and to ask questions. You know, this is your time. We have two hours together today. Um, and I was just telling Jenna that the more interactive we are, the more you guys ask questions and ask for clarification, the better it'll go. This is not a lecture where I just talk for two hours straight. Um, one, I don't have enough material for today's topic to talk for two hours straight. And two, we will all die of boredom before that happens. Um, so please, if you don't feel comfortable talking, I understand that there is a chat question box feature or something that you guys can um, uh, send in your questions um, in the chat box and then I can just read it and then answer it. Um, but by all means, if you have questions, you know, feel free to interrupt me. Um, unmute yourself, you know, just talk and that's totally cool because like I said, this is your time. And I think the way that you're going to get the most out of it is by asking the questions that you have um, or, you know, asking for more information or clarification. So before I get to what today's um, workshop is about, let me tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I live in Essex, Connecticut. I'm married and have two kids. I have been a full-time novelist since 2012. Um, I have three published books, all with major um, independent, I'm sorry, major traditional publishing houses. The first two were published by Thomas Dunn, which is an imprint of Macmillan, which is one of the top five um, big houses in the country. Uh, my first book, I don't know if you guys can see it, is Night Blindness. It came out in October of 2014. Um, and it was an indie next pick, which is where all the independent bookstores in the country get together. And the release month of you know any new releases that are coming out for that month, they all get together and they vote on the ones that they really want to spotlight and highlight. And so Night Blindness was an indie next pick, which I have to tell you was thrilling, um, being a debut novel and all. I was never expecting anything like that. So that was extremely cool. And then my next book came out in March of 2016 and it's called Nowhere Girl. It also was published by Thomas Dunn um, and it won the Beverly Hill Book Awards for Excellence in Fiction. Um, it is a mystery. I did not know it was a mystery when I wrote it. It was not my intention, but I was invited to lecture at a mystery conference. Um, and who knew? <laughs> they, I, I didn't know. Um, and then my third book, um, I changed houses um, for my third book. And this one is called Drive. It's a little bit different. Um, it's based in 1989, which is unusual. My first two books were set in present day. This book is based in 1989 and it has a little bit more of a masculine feel. It is about the NASCAR um, car racing world. Um, and it was published by, um, Kohler Books in October, last October, and it was runner up in the Book Pipeline Award. And I'm currently working with a Hollywood liaison company to pitch it to major uh, TV networks. Um, they want to make either a TV series, they're thinking for you know regular cable, probably CMT or ABC, um, but also there are so many great books out there that are now streaming on Hulu and Netflix, there's uh, you know Little Fires Everywhere, there's Daisy Jones and the Six, um, there's I think the Manic, the Manic High Rock, Castle High Rock, something like that. Um, so, so we have choices, um, so that's very, very exciting. Um, so that's where I am. I am also, I've written two more books and in various phases of editing. Um, editing is hard, rewriting is hard, the second round is hard, first rounds are easy because you just go out there and get it done. Um, second round, third round, fourth round, you know, many, many, many revisions and rewrites are hard. 
Um, so that's what I'm doing with my two other ones. And I just started my sixth one, but that's going to have to wait until I get books four and five done. Um, I also edit about 50 books a year. Um, I do all genres, both fiction and nonfiction. Um, the reason why I do that is for it's twofold. One, because there's a lot of downtime in production when books are in production. Um, and it gives me something to do. It keeps me entertained. Um, and also it helps make me a better writer. You know, it's very hard for me to say, hey, you know, to my clients, you should be doing this, that, and other thing, and then not do them myself. Um, you know, it's kind of practice what you preach. Um, and it's, uh -oh, I don't know what I did there. Um, it's, it's hard, but it, I think it does make me a better writer. And it's fun. I really enjoy working with writers because I know what it's like to be an unknown, you know, trying to get it done. And, um, you know, the odds are very, very stacked against us in the publishing world. And that will be the third series. Um, the third workshop in this series is publishing options, um, basically talking about self-publishing versus traditional publishing and the pros and cons of both. So that is me. Um, any questions about any of that, let me know. Um, today's workshop, I want to talk about the seven elements that all great novels need. Um, and although this workshop is geared toward novels, it, I, a lot of what I'm talking about today also applies to nonfiction. Um, and I compiled this list of seven things by doing three things. One, by writing my own books. Two, by working with my editor, who is, who is fabulous. Um, her name is Suzanne Kingsbury. Um, I've been with her since I started working on my first novel in 2009. Um, and I pray that she never leaves me because she is a genius. Um, and getting information back from her and feedback from her, I started to see through my three books, I started to see a pattern of, hey, this is what this, this is how the structure should go. This is how, you know, we should build upon characters and build upon backstory and the pacing and the flow and all that kind of stuff. So I, I kind of made this list of the seven things that stood out to me the most when I was both writing and getting Suzanne's notes back. And then as well, when I started doing all this editing work, I mean, throughout my career, I've probably edited, oh gosh, I don't know, 500 books. Um, and that I start to see the same, the same kind of structure in, or I should say lack of in what I'm editing and how I feel the books can be improved. So I made this list, you know, I was the geeky kid that loved school and, you know, sat by myself under a tree at recess and read, um, you know, rather than having to play kickball or something awful like that. Um, you know, and so I started making this list and of the seven things that books need, um, basically for my own education, because I thought it would help me be a better writer. And then when I kind of stumbled into these lectures and, you know, doing these workshops at, um, both libraries and conferences and writing workshops and stuff like that, I thought, wow, this is really good content. This is really good stuff that I think will help people. Um, so that is today, the seven elements. Um, and if anybody has any questions before I get started, please unmute yourself or type a little note and let me know. And please don't be quiet. This is gonna be a long two hours if you guys are quiet. <laughs> Anyone? All right. Um, I, I, oh, go for I have it. a question. Can you please? Um, was your did you have an educational background in writing? I'm sorry, I didn't look you up before. <laughs> I'm not sure how much you would have found on me if you had. I'm not that interesting. <laughs> um, a yes and no. I graduated from Drew University in Madison, New Jersey, a long time ago in 1993. Um, I have a um, bachelor's degree in psychology, but I had a double minor in writing in fiction and nonfiction writing. And then as soon as I graduated in 93, I went right into a um, graduate program, a four year, very intensive graduate program um, for marriage and family therapy. Um, so I also have a master's degree in family therapy. And I was a therapist for a long time. And then I was something else for a long time. And then I stayed home with my kids for a long time. And here I am now. Um, so I do have a minor in writing fiction and nonfiction, but I can almost guarantee you that it was zero helpful to me in writing because mostly because it had been so long that I kind of forgot everything that I learned. 
Um, I did stay in touch with my favorite professor and I have been back to Drew to teach um, week long seminars, uh, graduate se postgraduate seminars in the summer at Drew. Um, so that's been really cool that I've stayed in touch with Professor Reedy. Um, but he was also my poetry professor and I can guarantee you that there's no poetry in any of my books. Um, so I do have a minor in writing, but I'm not sure how helpful it has been. I found my master's degree in family therapy to be a lot more helpful because there's so much psychology in writing, you know, family drama and women's fiction and you know, the kind of books that I write. I found that being a therapist has been a lot more useful than everything else. So just to uh, get a clear understanding, hi, I'm Lisa. So you're Hi. So you're saying basically, even though your minor is nothing that you can really say it has helped you to get to the publication of your first book, which, you know, that sounds exciting. What did you do in order to get to that point? Um, how did you prepare? Did you just start writing or did you take some workshops, did you take some classes or you just started writing? I just started writing. You know, I'm very much a lone wolf. I've, I've always been that way. And to tell you the truth, a lot of the reason why I am kind of this lone wolf is because I didn't know that there were writing workshops out there. I didn't know that there were people like me that would help. Um, so I kind of stumbled through it. I wrote a first draft of my first novel, which I'll be honest with you, if you looked at the first draft of Night Blindness and then looked at what is on the bookshelves now, you would not, other than the fact that the title is the same, you would not know it was the same book. And when I talk about the second draft and rewriting and revising and rewriting, I really truly mean rewriting, like scrapping what you have and starting over. Um, so I wrote the first draft of Night Blindness because I had the job that I had required a lot of travel and my kids were itty bitty and they were starting school and I couldn't take them with me anymore. So I quit that job and I was home and you know that two hours that coveted two hours a day when they were in school, kindergarten and uh, preschool. Um, I thought, well, I could either shower or I could write. So I started writing and it took about a year. Um, and then I wrote the first draft of Night Blindness. And I kept thinking all along, like at some point I'm going to have to take a shower and put on real clothes and go get a job. Um, I assumed I would go back into therapy and probably work in a hospital, um, maybe in grief counseling. Um, I'm pretty glad I didn't go that way. Um, but I wrote this first draft and all along just assuming that someday I'd have to get off my butt and go get a real job. Um, and then I kind of stumbled into Suzanne who read my, I sent her my manuscript um, and she read it and we met, she lived in Vermont at the time, um, and we met in Massachusetts and I spent an afternoon with her and it went from there. Um, you know, the, her very first words to me were, I loved your books, but it's not, a, it's not a novel. Um, so then I spent about another year working with her, um, to polish it and rewrite it and get it as perfect as it could be. And then we started the, uh, the querying process for agents. Um, so in, I would say probably 60% of the people that I work with in terms of editing have taken workshops and a lot of them have, um, invested a lot of time and sometimes money um in doing these workshops and and a, i would say probably 20 percent of the people that i work with have um an mfa in writing um and i think any education you get is great i will tell you that all the education that i have everything i have learned um about writing and writing well has come from suzanne um and working with her over and over you know and, and i can't tell you they say you have to write about a hundred, what do you know, the way they say a thousand pages to, to get 300 good ones. I would say it's probably closer to 3000 pages to get 300 good ones. Um, so there's been a lot of editing and a lot of learning in the time that I've been with Suzanne. Um, and, you know, I like to think I'm pretty good. I have three books that have done well. They've all won awards. You know, I, I like to think that they're not terrible, but I will also tell you that I will never not write a book with without an editor or I will never, I will never write a book without an editor. Um, and I will always be learning. Um, so I think it's, I think the process is, 
you can absolutely learn stuff from workshops like mine and classes and um, conferences and stuff, but also getting into it and working with an editor is really, I think, what's going to help the most for everybody. Hello. Don't, don't get me wrong. This is going to be very helpful. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um, yeah, I have uh, two questions and then also just a personal favor to ask you. Uh, first question is, what's the benefit of local writers groups, you know, getting involved with a local writers group? The second question is about your editing. Do you do that as a agent or uh, employee of a publishing house or do you do that um, as an independent and how do we uh, contact you if we're interested in having you as an editor. And then the personal thing is, can you put your phone so that it's stable because it's rocking back and forth in the back and I'm getting vertigo watching you. Sorry, sorry, I'm in a rocking chair. <laughs> that that could be the problem. And it's my computer, no, I'll stop itself, rocking now. It's the phone itself uh, moving. So your background is moving uh, also. Uh, I, the background, I, I hope it's not moving because it's a wall. Um, I am in a rocking chair, but I will stop. I will stop rocking myself. Sorry about that. Um, so your first question, um, what is the benefit of writers groups? Um, and again, that's something that I have never been a part of. Um, I do have some writer friends who I have some author friends who I've gotten connected with through mostly through actually doing stuff with libraries, um, the Connecticut Authors Trail. Um, and I, the, the benefit, I think the biggest benefit of being in a writer's group is sharing your work and getting feedback and input about it. Um, and that's great because anybody who's ever written anything or really done anything, including parenting, sometimes we're too close to it. You know, it's, uh, I, I will tell you, it's a lot easier for me to parent my, my friend's kids and, you know, discipline their kids than it is for me to do mine. Um, because I'm too close to my kids. And it's the same thing with books. You know, you get, you, you work on a book for a long time or a short story or a poem or whatever it is. And it gets, um, it gets to be so that you know the material so well that you can't really see the forest through the trees. And I, I hate using cliches, but sometimes that's the easiest way. Um, so writer's group will give you a new perspective, especially if you're in a writer's group with people who are not your friends, because people who aren't your friends are not as invested in not hurting your feelings. Um, so the benefit of a writer's group is just that, that you get outside opinions, you get sometimes brutally honest opinions, sometimes you get um, just brutal opinions that are not very helpful. Um, I find, and it's probably like this in any business, but I find really in the writing world, especially now in the world of social media and Amazon and online reviews and Goodreads and all that other kind of stuff, you gotta have thick skin. Um, you know, I've gotten one star reviews. Any author that tells you they haven't gotten one star re reviews is lying. Um, you know, so I've never been a part of a writer's group. I have a friend named Susan who is, and I have to tell you, sometimes I'm a little envious of her because she does get that kind of bouncing ideas off other people. Um, so, so the benefit, I would say the benefits of doing a writer's group are you do get to bounce ideas, you know, you brainstorm, you know, it's true what they say, two, two heads are better than one. Um, so if you're stuck, um, if you're having that awful proverbial writer's block, sometimes it's easier to talk about it with somebody else or a group of somebody else's. And then you also get feedback, you know, Susan, um, tells me that she goes every week and they all take turns reading and that they critique each other and that they kind of have this unspoken rule of, hey, you know, we're gonna be honest and if you don't like it, too bad. Um, the downside of that is everybody has an opinion. Um, you know, you ask 10 different people, you're gonna get 12 different answers and they're all gonna be right, you know, just ask them. So, you know, a lot of people have early readers or what they call beta readers. Um, sometimes they're just random people off the internet. Sometimes they're friends. I have never used beta readers um, for that very reason, because I'm not sure I really care what somebody off the street thinks. Now, the flip side of that is maybe I should care because that is my reader, you know, that's my audience, you know, some Joe Schmo who's wandering through a bookstore or scrolling through the book list on Amazon, you know, that is my target audience. Um, so there, there are pros and cons to everything. I just haven't gotten around to being, I don't know, I don't, I don't know if brave is the right word, but I haven't gotten around to being invested enough in having beta readers or joining a writer's group. I do think it can be helpful. 
Um, it just really depends on who you are and what you're looking for. I would rather spend my time and money with a professional, somebody like me who knows what I'm talking, who knows what they're talking about, or, or more specifically, somebody like Suzanne, who really knows what she's talking about. Um, but I do, I don't want to discourage writers groups because a lot of bookstores have them, a lot of libraries have them, and I do think they can be extremely uh, helpful. I think it just depends on what you're looking for. Um, and your second question of how to get in touch with me, um, I can give you all my contact information right now if that's helpful or at the end. Um, you can also, well, I'll just give you everything, everybody now in case you want to. Um, and all you have to do is shoot me an email or call me or contact me through my website. Um, I'm really good about getting back to people. I'm not so good if you contact me on my um, author page on Facebook because I don't get the notifications, but everything else I, I respond within 24 hours. Um, so my email address is S-U-S-A-N-S-T-R-E-C-K-E-R the number one at Gmail. So it's Susan Strecker one at gmail.com. Um, and my website is Susan There is a contact me or I'd love to hear from you button um, that you can send me a message and I do get those messages. And that's just S U S A N S T R E C K E R.com. Um, and, um, my cell phone number is 860-388-7899. And I just got a chat message that I cannot read because I don't have my glasses on. And it says, could you write it here, please? Oh, yes, I would love to. Excellent, excellent suggestion. Um, so my email is susanstrecker1 at gmail.com. My cell phone is 860388 387899. My website is Susan All right, there you go. So now you guys have it in writing. Excellent suggestion. Thank you. Um, so any other questions before I get started? I have a question. I'm wondering how um, relevant you feel your lessons today will be to writing children's fiction and if you've had experience editing novels for children? Um, I think it's extremely relevant. Um, it also depends a little bit on, you know, in terms of children, there's children's books, um, which are generally the board books, you know, that we give to our kids when they're babies and they eat. Um, uh, and then there's middle grade, um, and then there's young adult. So, you know, the children's books are usually about 500 words. The middle grade are usually about between 30 and 50,000 words. And then the young adult can be, are usually, you know, full length novels between, I would say 75 and 100,000 words. So obviously the more complex and involved um, your novel is, the more it will relate to what I'm talking about today. But even for the children's books that, you know, we, we read to our kids when they're babies, um, this can certainly be um, relevant. Um, you know, for a 500 word picture book or, you know, board book, it's not going to be as relevant just because there's just not that much content. Um, but it, it certainly, I've worked with, actually, I just finished three children's books um, in the last week, including one last night, excuse me. Um, and I've done a bunch of middle grade and YA novels. Um, I would say throughout my career, between the three, I've done probably 80 of them. Um, the majority of them being the children's books, you know, the very short board books um, with, you know, with the pictures. But, I, you know, it is, it is relevant. Um, it just depends on what exactly you're writing. Um, but I would say it is relevant. Um, any other questions? Oh, just, that was just a thank you. Okay. All right, so again, um, and these are great questions. Thank you for asking them and feel free to interrupt. Um, like I said, this is gonna be a super boring two hours um, if you guys don't interrupt me and ask questions and I'm impossible to offend, so never worry about interrupting me. I have children, I'm used to it. Um, so the first element that I, I think is the most important part of any very successful novel is the kicker. Um, the kicker is something, the kicker and the hook are different. Um, 
the kicker is something that happens before the novel opens and it can be anything. It doesn't have to be a huge event. It doesn't have to be an event that happens immediately before the book opens. It can happen a hundred years before the book opens. It can happen as soon, you know, moments before the book opens and it can really be anything. Um, I did a workshop, a three series workshop at Scranton Memorial Library in Madison. And I did, it was a huge group. I had about 38 people in it. Um, and I did have one woman heckle me because she did not like my answer about what the kickers usually are, you know, and it's, it's kind of like that Don Henley song, um, you know, dirty, dirty laundry, you know, people like, people like stuff like that, you know, so a lot of times the kickers are, you know, a murder or an affair or a runaway or some kind of, you know, assault or something like that. It doesn't have to be, it can be anything, just anything that captures the reader's interest. And even more important than that, the kicker really has to be something that is the motivation for the main character for the protagonist journey. Everything that the main character does is based on the kicker. Um, probably the easiest way for me to really explain it is just to use my books as examples. Um, I'm trying to think, oh, I, oh yeah, pro yeah, I'll just use my books. So um, oftentimes there are two kickers. There's sometimes a kicker that takes place a long time before the book, and then sometimes ones that take place right before the book opens. And occasionally the kicker can happen within the first few pages. The only book I can think of off the top of my head where the kicker happens right as the book opens is White Oleander by Janet Fitch, which was an amazing debut novel. If you haven't read it, you have to read it. It's beautiful. Um, and within the first couple of pages, the main characters, her name is Astrid, her mother poisons her lover with White Oleander. Um, what was so the name of that book? I'm sorry. The name of the uh, book? It's called White Oleander. And it's by Janet Fitch, F-I-T-C-H. Um, and it's, it's a great book. Um, but so like in my first novel, Night Blindness, there are two kickers. Um, the first one happens, the premise of the book is it's about a woman named Jenny, who when the book opens, it's her 29th birthday. And she's having a party with her husband. Um, and she gets a phone call from her mother saying that her father is sick and she has to come home. Um, so, and Jenny doesn't want to go home. She hasn't been home in like 13 years. Um, so the, the first kicker, the one that happened a long time before the book opened, um, is that when Jenny was a teenager, when she was 16, 15 or 16, her brother died. Um, and, you know, as you can imagine, the death of a child is hard on a family and it kind of tore her family apart and she couldn't deal with it. So she left, she went to boarding school, then she went to college out West, and then she married this very free loving artist and kind of became, became like living this bohemian lifestyle out in New Mexico. Um, so the first kicker that happened was when Will died. Um, and everything that Jenny has done since, good or bad, is because of Will. You know, she ran away because of Will. She went to school out West because of Will. She never came home because of Will. Um, you know, it was just too hard. She saw what it did to her parents and what it did to their relationship with her. And it was just too hard. So every, and you know, marrying a guy that I don't know for sure that she really loved this guy, um, you know, it was just to get away. It was just to get away from her family. So that is the kicker. That's the long-term kicker. And then the short term one happens five seconds before the book opens, or mm, probably an hour before the book opens. It's when her father is diagnosed um, and he has a brain tumor. And, um, you know, so an hour or so before her mother calls her, she gets the mother gets this information that the father has a brain tumor and calls Jenny right as the book opens and says, you have to come home. You know, daddy is sick and I need your help. Um, so everything that Jenny's done from the time that her brother died when she was 16 until her birthday party when the book opens the day that she turns 29 is because of Will. And then her decision to go home and kind of face her past and face her demons is because of the short-term kicker of her father being sick. She has no desire to go home. She doesn't want to see her mother. She desperately misses her father. Um, but now she has to, you know, she doesn't trust her mother to take care of her father. She doesn't trust, um, you know, she doesn't know what's going to happen. She doesn't know if he's going to die and she doesn't want him to have to go through this alone. So she does go home. But then from the moment the book opens until the moment it closes, everything that happens is because of those two things. 
the way she acts, the way she interacts with her family, the secrets that she keeps, the lies that she tells are because of Will and what happened. And, you know, she has a secret about Will. And, you know, the kicker is usually a secret, um, you know, because let's face it, you know, humans are nosy. We like to know what happens. You know, we like the mysteries. We like the teasers of, you know, TV shows. And, you know, we watch movie trailers and we, we go to the movies to see these, these, sagas happen because of the trailer and because it looks interesting and there's some kind of secret that we want to know. So um, everything that the main character does is because of the kicker. Um, and it, so that right there is a huge help. It's something to keep in mind when you're writing that every single thing that the writer, that the main character does has to be because of the kicker. Um, it's very, very easy to get a little bit lost and to just go off on tangents when you're writing, and that's fine. Um, my son's fourth grade teacher, her name is Miss Ricci, used to have her kids write for half an hour and just write for fun and write anything they wanted, and she never corrected punctuation or spelling. I mean, these kids were like nine, um, and she just let them write for fun, and then she called it the sloppy copy, and then later they'd come back and they'd fill in the blanks and make it a little bit better, um, and, you know, edit a little bit and clean up their spelling mistakes. And then, you know, that's was what she called editing. So your first copy, and I love Miss Ricci and I love that term. So you're, I always think of the first copy of my books or your books or anybody's books really is the sloppy copy. So it's okay to make them sloppy and to make them go off on tangents. And that's fine because that's what editing is for. And that's what, um, you know, that's why we re revise and rewrite and edit and, you know, do that. 10 times before the book is done. Um, but everything in a novel, and this is like, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say golden rule about 15 times today, but this is really one of the golden rules of writing. Everything that happens in a book has to push the story forward. Um, and that just means that if you can take out a character or a thread, which is like a subplot or, um, a paragraph or a passage or even a sentence that doesn't do anything to increase the tension and to ramp up the excitement of the book, then it has to go. Um, so when you're writing, if you can think, when you're writing a scene, if you can think of, okay, how does the kicker affect the scene? How does what happened, you know, a month ago or a year ago or a hundred years ago, how does that affect this scene? And if it doesn't, then you can stop writing. I mean, you can keep writing if you want to, but you're probably going to end up scrapping that in your next round, or even maybe the next time you reread that section. Um, so it's, it's hard to do. And I will tell you with my first novel, because I'd never heard of doing anything like this before, when Suzanne started telling me like, oh, you've got to kill your darlings and you have to, you know, scrap this section and that section and this character. She made me get rid of a whole character because he didn't do anything to push the story forward. I was heartbroken. Like, I can't tell you how many times, I, I was kind of a weenie, how many times I sat on my living room floor and cried because I was just like, oh my God, like, I don't know how to do this. What is happening? Um, but again, you know, after I got over that little temper tantrum of wanting to keep everything that I wrote because it was just so good, um, you know, it, it became easier. Now I keep that as a guideline. Okay, what is the kicker? What happened? Um, and how does that affect what my main character is doing? In my second book, it's about identical twins named Savannah and Katie. Um, 18 years before the book opens, Savannah is murdered and they never catch her killer. And so that's the kicker. And so they were murdered when I think they were 14. She was murdered when they were 14. Um, and so Katie's, Katie's now an adult. I think she's 32 when the book opens. And her whole life, everything that she does, and she's become a, a mystery writer, a crime novelist, um, because like what Mark, what Mark Twain says is true. We write about what we know. So Katie spends all this time writing these mystery novels trying to solve her sister's murder when in fact she's just stuck, you know, she's just stuck in the past. She's just cannot imagine living her life without her twin sister and everything that she does is driven by the fact that her sister is murdered and even more so that they never caught the guy. They have no idea. And this takes, the book is set in New Jersey outside of Princeton, New Jersey, but the town could be Brantford or Madison or Essex or Clinton or, you know, any one of these sleepy little towns. Um, you know, so that's, that's kind of her motivation. Um, 
and the kicker that everything she does is because her sister was murdered. In my third book, Drive, um, the one about the NASCAR racing world, um, six years, five years, five years before the book opens, um, Piper, who's the main character, was a race car driver as a teen, and she was involved in a really bad accident that almost killed her father. And then after that, she quit racing, she quit driving, she quit like enjoying life, she quit doing everything. And everything that she does, or in Piper's instance, I should say everything that she doesn't do, um, is because of the accident that almost took her father's life. She kind of spends her life punishing herself for something that really wasn't her fault. I mean, it was an accident. Um, so the kicker is something that affects the main character, it happens to the main character or any, it doesn't necessarily have to happen to the main character because like I said in my first book, it was, it was Jenny's brother that died. And in the second book, it was uh, Katie's sister that died. I like dead people. Um, I like dead people in my books because they add a whole other layer. Um, it's very interesting for me to write about somebody who's not alive anymore, but is still such a huge presence in these people's lives to be a main character, to, but, but to never really be seen on this page, to never really be introduced to um, the reader in real time because they've been dead for five years or 10 years or however many years um, is interesting to me. And I do think that that's where my uh, training as a therapist comes in because I worked with so many families that were in you know, the acute stages of grief. Um, so the kicker is just anything that happens and it, you know, it, Suzanne, my editor, her debut novel is one of my favorite books ever. It's called The Summer Fletcher Greel Loved Me. Um, and the kicker in that book is that the main character, um, her name is Haley, her father, when she was a teenager, killed the guy and buried him in his backyard. Um, and he doesn't know that Haley knows. <laughs> well, imagine being that kid, knowing there's a dead guy, you know, under your sycamore tree. Um, so it can be something big like a murder or a death or an affair, but it really can be anything. Um, and that's something that is really one of the best parts of writing is that we get to, um, we get to make up whatever we want. Um, and it, you know, we can take a small thing and make it a big thing. Um, so that really is up to you. Um, any other, any questions about what I'm talking about so far? I know I've been talking for a while about the kicker. I was going to say one of the kickers that I, we all probably remember is the opening to A Tale of Two Cities. You know, it happened, um, the, uh, the imprisonment of the father, you know, happened, I don't know, 15 yeah. years before. And, you know, aside from the great opening paragraph, um, the actual happening was there and then that, that everything else that follows until the end. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I never thought of it, it quite that same way. So that's, that's great. That's a great explanation. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, and on that's, almost every novel, you know, mm -hmm. prologues, oftentimes that, that one or two page prologue that happened, you know, does the same kind of thing. So that's great. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. And that's, you know, that's a book that I hadn't considered. Um, but I think now, you know, and, and I can't help myself now, now I have to, um, now I have to go back and um, look at, you know, well, what is the kicker, you know, even if it's a book that I've read before, mm -hmm. um, that, you know, because it, because I think it's so helpful, you know, if we can keep the main character on the trajectory, you know, there's books have arcs, you know, you start with when the book opens and then you build the tension, build the tension, build the tension, build the tension. And then when you get to the top of the arc, that's when the denouement or the climax happens. And then the book starts to wind down, um, you know, so if you can keep that arc in mind or, you know, when you're writing the arc or when you're shaping the arc of your book, if you think, if you can think of the main character's motivation for why they're going on this journey and why you as a reader should care to go on this journey with them, then, um, you know, I think that's super, super helpful. Um, I just got a question that says, here come the glasses again. Uh, Susan, structurally, do you recommend starting with an outline? Um, and that is a fabulous question. Um, and it will get me into a little bit of a side conversation here, um, but it's, it's important. And so thank you for asking. 
Um, outlines, there are two types of writers in the world. There are plotters, who are the people that write the outlines. Um, I follow some very famous authors on social media just so I can see what I should be doing as opposed to what I am doing. Um, and some of them like Ellen Hildebrand, who's a very beachy writer, all her books are set in Nantucket. Um, and some other ones um, have these giant storyboards, which are like these big um, like cork boards where they basically outline their novel. Um, Jeffrey Deaver is another one. It takes him longer to outline his novels than it does for him to write them because he's so detailed in, you know, this is what happens in the first chapter and this is what happens in the second chapter. And then so it's basically, it's almost like a Mad Libs that when they're done, by the time they're done making the outline and fill it in, um, it's, it's like just filling in the blanks, just like a Mad Libs. And obviously that's simplified. Um, so the benefit of writing an outline is it helps keep you very, very structured. Um, and it gives you, it kind of takes away the guessing factor um, that if you have every, um, I've heard it referred to as a story Bible or uh, sometimes just a plain outline. Um, I call them riffs um, it, where basically you take every character and write down everything you can think about that character. Um, I, when I write, I write alone. Well, in an ideal world, I write alone in a quiet room so I don't get distracted. But when I write the riffs for my characters, I purposely do it when my kids are home and my husband's home and the TV's on and you know there are 4,000 things going on because it just helps give me ideas. And riffs are like stream of consciousness off the top of your head, everything you'd wanna know about that character. Um, you know, and not just like, like how tall they are, or how much they weigh, what color their hair is, but like crazy things that you would never think of. Like if they're a boy, do they wear boxers or briefs? If they're girls, do they shave or wax? Have they ever stolen anything? You know, who is their first kiss? What's their favorite lip, you know, lipstick? Um, you know, for boys, what's their favorite sport? Uh, how, you know, what's their favorite candy? Just anything you can think of, just bullet point it, just write it all down. Because then when you are going in and writing and filling in the story, to come back to that list to be like, oh, you know what? When she was 14, she got caught stealing a pack of gum. Just might add another layer. You know, the more interesting you can make your characters, the more real life you can make them. And I will get to that in a minute. Poverties and flaws is one of the things. Um, you know, the more invested your reader's going to be because we want to, you know, unless you're writing about like sci-fi aliens or some, you know, weird thing like that. Um, you know, you want your readers to be able to relate to your characters. So the benefit of writing an outline is that it helps keep you very, very structured. Um, Jody Paco, who is my second favorite author in the world, my first was Pat Conroy. He was my lord and savior of the writing world. Um, Jody Paco is a near second, um, and I've seen her speak a bunch of times. I love her. Every time she comes through RJ Julia, um, I go see her speak. And probably her most famous book, or at least at the time when I went to see her, was her 11th novel, and it's called My Sister's Keeper. And one of the things that I love about Jodi is that she writes very sad endings. Um, you know, she kills main characters, which takes a lot of chutzpah to do that. Um, and, but her, her endings are realistic, you know? Sometimes people die, sometimes people we love leave us, you know, who else? Sometimes life isn't fun. And that's what I love about her books is that she's very, very, realistic in her endings. In My Sister's Keeper, she killed one of the main characters who happened to be a child. And I was pregnant when I read it and it just it tore my heart out. Um, but anyway, so when I was seeing her um, speak, somebody asked her about that book and said, you know, did you know how it was gonna end before you got to the ending? And she said, I knew every word before I picked up my pen. And I thought to myself, you lucky bitch. Like that never happens to me. So she, pardon my language. So she, I don't mean it, I worship her. Um, you know, so she clearly is a plotter, um, you know, because she knew exactly what was gonna happen. And I think that's fabulous, you know, good for her. I think it's fabulous. And honestly, it probably makes writing so much easier because you know, like, oh, in chapter two, well, what does my notes say? Oh, my notes say this is gonna happen. Um, and then, so those are plotters and those are the people that outline. And if your brain lets you think like that, I highly recommend it. Unfortunately, somewhere in my head, the wiring didn't quite connect. Um, and I, I can't, like the thought of doing that is like parallel parking in the city in front of a crowd. Like it makes me sweat. Like I just, I just can't. Um, 
so there are the plotters and then there are the pantsers and I'm definitely <laughs> here. Um, the pantsers are those of us who write off the seat of our pants, meaning we just let the story tell itself. Um, I consider myself, the two analogies I use are one, I'm just, I'm just a, like a, like a court reporter, like a transcriptionist. Um, you know, I hear all the voices of all the people that live in my head and there are a lot of them. Um, and I just write down their story. You know, they talk to me and I write down their story. So my books are very character driven because I don't have an outline. I don't have any kind of structure. I just, I just write whatever happens. Um, and honestly, every time I open my computer, it's like, it's like that movie 50 first, 50 first dates. It's like a brand new day. I never know what's going to happen. Characters start dating that I didn't even know they liked each other. Like, you know, people do things that I had no idea they were going to do. Um, and it does make it hard to make the book follow that arc of the trajectory of the story when I'm just writing whatever comes to me. But it also gives me a certain kind of freedom because I'm just writing what they want me to write. Um, so it's really what you're comfortable with. I can't recommend one or the other, the plotter or the pantser. I, I do think if I had to write a book, you know, somebody put a gun to my head and said, write an outline and then write the book, I think it would probably be terrible because that's just not how I think. Um, I do think writing would be easier and maybe not take so long if I did have any flipping idea where my books were going, but it's just not how I do it. Um, my books, I usually rewrite the beginning you know, the first chapter or the first several pages about 15 times and the same thing with the ending. I'll rewrite them about 15 times because I don't know how they're going to end. And a lot of times, even when the book is over, I don't know how it's going to end. I wrote the entire novel, Nowhere Girl, the one with the murdered sister, not knowing who killed her. Um, and I'm not a, I'm not a writer that's going to bring some random person, you know, that wasn't a main character off the street to have him be the bad guy because I feel like that's cheating the reader. So I had to make it one of the main characters and there were probably, I don't know, eight central characters in the book. And so I got to the end of the book, I wrote the last scene and then I wrote, went back and wrote the scene for every single person in the book having killed this poor girl, which was really hard. You know, as a parent, I had to make her mother kill her and then I had to make her father kill her and then I had to make her twin sister kill her and her best friend and all these other people. And it was really, really hard. But I just didn't know. I didn't, I didn't care who killed her. It wasn't the point of the book. Um, and it wasn't how I think. Like, it wasn't like, oh, you know, this is how my book is going to go. This girl's going to get murdered and this person did it. And then I have to fill in that, you know, those 300 pages in between dying and capturing the killer. Um, that's definitely not how it worked for me. Um, but it also made ending the book very, very hard because I had no idea how it was going to end. Um, I did eventually figure it out and I think it worked. You never really know. Um, you know, people have different opinions. Um, but in terms, so in terms of writing an outline or not writing an outline, it really is up to you. Um, what you feel most comfortable with. I would say probably the majority of writers use an outline or some kind of guide. Um, and if you can do that, absolutely do it. That's, you know, it's fabulous. But if you're like me, you know, fear not. If you can't think of an outline or if it feels too restrictive to do it, then, you know, definitely don't worry about it. Um, I hope that was, I hope that was helpful. Um, next question. At what point in the novel do you usually reveal the kicker? Um, so the kicker can get revealed. Um, and that's a great question. Thank you. Thank you for asking it, Jane. Um, the kicker is something that really the reader knows um, from the get-go because it's their motivation and it's the, the kicker is not like um, it's not like the big reveal. It's not like the climax. It's not the secret. It's the motivation. Um, so the, like in, in um, uh, Night Blind is my first novel. The kicker was that Will died. The, climax kind of there were two climaxes in that book the climax was how will died you know everybody but jenny thought will died a certain way and she knew what really happened so the the kicker is not the climax so the kicker is something that you want to reveal right away um and i will just read you the first um really essentially just the first line of both my first two books so you can know how immediately um the kicker is revealed. So this is the first line in Night Blindness. I hadn't been able to drive at night since Will died. Okay, so now we know 
Will is dead. We don't know who Will is. We don't know how he died. And we don't know how it affected Jenny that, you know, what does a dead brother or this dead person named Will have to do with her driving at night and why can't she drive at night anymore? But this is a very, very simplified explanation of the kicker, but that is the kicker. Um, and then in Nowhere Girl, the first line is, hang on, glasses. The day Savannah was killed, she was 15 late, she, blah, sorry. The day Savannah was killed, she was 15 minutes late to meet me. So again, same thing. We know Savannah's dead. We know she was late. Um, we don't know who Savannah is. We very, very quickly find out that Will was Jenny's brother and that Savannah is Katie's sister. Um, so the kicker is something that gets revealed right away because it's not the secret. The climax is something that gets revealed probably, I would say, three quarters of the way through the book, maybe a little bit farther. Um, and that's another one that, thing that I'm going to talk about in the the seven elements. Um, but the pacing is really important because if you reveal the climax too soon, then you have a hundred pages left of your book and your reader's like, dude, why am I still reading? I know what happened. Um, you know, like I said in the beginning, we read these books to get to the secret. We're nosy creatures by nature. We want to know what happened. Um, you know, we like digging into characters' lives and really getting inside their heads. So if the if the climax happens too soon in the book, then it's kind of a letdown and you're left reading 100 pages of like summary and, you know, blah, stuff that doesn't have anything to do with the rest of the book. Um, on the flip side of that, if the climax is revealed 10 pages before the end of the book, excuse me, it can often feel very rushed to the reader. Um, like, like the book ended rather than, or the book stopped rather than ended. Um, I don't know if that if that makes any sense, but I would say that happens more often when I'm reading that I, all of a sudden the book's just over and I'm like, what the hell just happened? Like, and then I have to go back and read it again. And I'm like, oh my God. Um, you know, so you don't want it to be too rushed. And that's very, it's a very, very, very fine line between, uh, you know, having too many pages of just worth, worthless blather at the end of the book and just having the book stop. Um, so that is something that we'll talk about, but it's, I would say, I would say three quarters to maybe whatever comes after, whatever fraction comes after three quarters of the way through the book is how you, um, is where you want to add the climax. So does that make sense, Jane? Um, the difference between the climax and the kicker? Didn't, I hope I answered that question. Um, um, yeah, um, earlier I thought you said that kicker was a secret, but I guess uh, that's what I wrote down, but I guess that wasn't what you... No, I, pro I probably did say that. Um, and, you know, <laughs> you I probably did. I take it back now. Um, <laughs> you know, I, so I guess I misspoke, really, and thank you for pointing that out, um, and not haggling me like that lady in Madison. Um, <laughs> what I meant was that, um, you know, the kicker is not... The kicker gets revealed, like, Will's dead, Savannah's dead, um, you know, uh, what's her name? Piper was in a car accident. So the actual event is not a secret, but what happened, the circumstances around those kickers are the secret. Okay, that I get it. Uh, also, I, I misspoke. That was, that was my oh, bad. Thank you. All right. Thank you for clarifying. I, I, I was one, the, um, I, I guess you'll get to it, but the kicker in those two examples sound like a hook to me. Um, the hook are is... You talk about the hook? later <laughs> the hook is that um the hook is really just anything that happens in the first couple of paragraphs to keep the reader entertained um to make him want to keep reading um so the hook is really just anything that grabs the reader's attention the kicker is the motivation um so we can um <clears throat> Mm -hmm. And this is, I get, I get stuck on this a lot. I'm trying to explain the difference. There's, there's just more backstory to a, uh, to a kicker than there is a hook. Um, you know, gone are the days of the 700 pages, page novels, you know, Russian literature where it takes 200 pages to get into it and have it be exciting. You know, now we live in the world of social media and instant messaging and 280 characters. And, you know, we all have the attention spans of gnats. Um, and if we don't write something to grab the reader's attention in the first couple of pages, well, you know, 90% of us are going to put the book down and keep wandering around the bookstore. So the hook is really just anything that just draws the reader in immediately. Um, does that make sense? 
Yeah, those. It's just that those two opening lines sounded pretty hooked. Like I would be hooked by that. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, that was the point. Uh, yeah, they they can be hookish. Um, the hook is just something that it's a it's a little bit of a cheap tactic in that you just want to grab the reader's attention. If the hook happens to be part of the kicker, that's fine. The kicker is something that goes throughout the whole novel that is constantly the um, the motivation for what the protagonist does. Awesome. Got it. Um, thank you. And I was just not so gently or gently reminded that we're an hour into it and I'm on one of seven, so I better keep moving. Um, and here I was just <laughs> 10 minutes before this started freaking out to Jenna that I didn't think I was going to have enough information um, to actually do this um, for two hours, but I guess I was wrong. Okay, so moving on. Um, and a lot of this, because everything in novels is related, um, a lot of this is going to be information that we've already talked about. So elements two through seven will go a little bit faster. Um, the second part of what you need for your novel is the main want and need of the character of the main character. Um, and that is also the motivation. It's usually related to the kicker and it's not usually something materialistic. Like, you know, she doesn't want the new car. She doesn't want to be skinny and fit into that jeans. She doesn't want the pretty prom dress. Um, you know, it's something, it's, it's something that was taken away from the main character, usually by the kicker and the kind of the, well, I can't remember. Um, uh, the, the crux, I guess, is the word I'm looking for. The crux of the main want and need of the of the protagonist is that their want and their need isn't always the same thing. And that's what creates the tension. You know, if the main character just skated through the book and got what they wanted all the time without any conflict, without any tension, it would A, be a very boring book and B, be a very short book. Um, so what you want to do with the main want and need of the character is think about what your kicker is and then relate that back. So like take Jenny in Night Blindness, for example, the one whose brother died, um, her main need is to come clean. She, she ran away from home or didn't run away from home, but moved away from home when she was 16 because she knew what happened to her brother when nobody else did. And she couldn't deal with the guilt and she couldn't deal with the sadness in her family. So she just left. So what she needs is to come clean with her parents, especially her father, if he has a life-threatening illness and explain to them what happened and maybe ask for forgiveness or maybe be forgiven. Um, what she wants is to have this happy family again without having to face the music, so to speak. Um, so they're not, the want and the need are not the same thing. And if you, the more you can make them butt heads, the want and the need, um, the more tension you will create and the more the climax will be meaningful. Um, you know, Jenny wants to go home, but she doesn't want to deal with her mother. She wants to um, get back together with her true love, Ryder, who was with her when Will died, but she has this pesky problem of already being married. Um, you know, she wants to be close to her parents again, but she doesn't want to have to tell them what happened. So what she needs is to be truthful. What she wants is to just have her life go back to the way it was before her brother died. And we all know that that's not going to happen. So that's really something along with the kicker that you have to keep in mind when you're writing is to think, what does this girl want or this boy or this man or this dog or whatever your main character is, alien? Um, you know, what does this person want in, from, from their journey? You know, what is it that they need? Um, Katie, the same thing. And Katie's, I think Katie's main want and need were so intricate and so interesting to me to write as, as, it, as I wrote and I wasn't really aware of what I was doing because like I said, I'm a pantser. Um, you know, Katie really, really wanted to find out who killed her sister. It was like, it consumed her. Um, what she needed though, was to let it go. And I will tell you without giving it away in case anybody wants to read my books, um, at the end, Katie did figure out who killed her sister, but I will tell you, you know, only Katie knows this for sure, but I will tell you, I think she would have been happier if she didn't know. So that's something, you know, there always has to be something dangerous out there. Like, is it worth it? Like, you know, um, Jenny, what she needed was to come clean with her father and tell him what really happened in case this guy, you know, dropped dead of his disease. Um, you know, so she needed to come clean with him, but the risk was, 
what if he didn't forgive her? What if he blamed her? You know, what if he said, you know, you ruined my life. How could you do this? And then he died. Um, you know, same thing with Katie. She really, really wanted to know who killed her sister, but then she had to deal with the consequences of knowing who it was. And if, you know, so now she doesn't have to live the rest of her life not knowing, now she has to live the rest of her life knowing who killed her. And that's not something that she considered. Um, so the more you can keep the want and the need in conflict with each other, the, the easier the book will be for you to write because it will create more tension. And that's what you want to do. Think of each scene that you write as, you know, little piles of tension piled on top of each other to the point where they get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger until they explode. And when they explode, um, that's the climax or the denouement, um, if you want to be fancy about it. Um, so the more tension you can, can create by having this kind of, um, uh, tension is the wrong word, but by having this dichotomy between the want and the need of the main character, the better off you will be. Um, and it's don't, don't freak out if you're writing the book and you think, well, I don't know what her want is. I don't know how it conflicts with her need. Um, you know, don't even worry about that because that's what second, third, fourth, you know, hundredth drafts are for. Um, and I will tell you that I, it took many drafts for me to get it right and to feel like um, I had created a layered enough character to have these kind of inner conflicts that were both the motivation and kind of in the end, the savior of these characters. Um, it is hard to do. It is something that takes practice, but you know, writing is a craft like any other. You know, if we're, we all have jobs, we all are probably better 10 years into our jobs than we were the first day on our jobs. Um, you know, and writing is like that. It's something that just takes practice. Um, does that make sense? Yes. Okay, excellent. Um, oh, darn, I lost my glasses. Um, somebody wrote, oh my God, I'm so blind. Uh, Tessa wrote what book? Um, Tessa, I don't know what you are, um, which book you're referring to. Um, if you type it again or ask, I will, I will tell you what book. Um, oh, oh, Tessa says, never mind. Okay, so um, the main want and the need of the character is something that you just want to keep in mind when you're writing, that it will help create the tension, it'll help create the scenes. Um, and I, I talk a lot about scenes when I'm giving these lectures and I don't talk about chapters. And there's a reason for that. Um, to write in chapters is a little bit, at least for me, it's a little bit overwhelming. Um, I have a tendency to write in scenes. I set a goal for myself every day, and it's usually between a thousand and fifteen hundred words, which is nothing. You know, there are usually about three hundred pages on a uh, three hundred words on a page. So a thousand words is you know three three plus pages. Fifteen hundred words is five pages. Like that's nothing. Um, you know, a, a, a well-trained monkey could do that. Um, you know, it's, it's not a lot of words, but, <laughs> but the problem is getting those words right. So um, to write in scenes makes it, takes off a lot of the pressure. You write in very short scenes, you know, three to five pages. It's a very specific thing that happens. All scenes have their own arc. They have their own little nugget nugget of conflict. Um, you know, and then you write the next scene and you build on that previous nugget of conflict and then you make it a little bit bigger and then a little bit bigger. Um, and by the time I'm done, um, my, I usually end up between, with between um, probably a 90 and 100 scenes. Um, so, and then I go back and I can pile them together. And the beauty of writing on a computer and the beauty of writing in scenes is that I can then either put like scenes one through five together and make that a chapter, or I can be like, oh my God, scene 70 really kind of goes with scene four. And so I can just, you know, cut and paste scene 70 and smush it onto scene four. Um, and that's okay, you know, to not know exactly which scenes go with which. They don't, I know a lot of people that write not in chronological order, you know, they'll want to write this, this um, thread first, you know, they'll want to write something that happens all the way through first. Um, yes, it's exactly like a puzzle. Lisa just said it's like a puzzle. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and you kind of move the pieces around until they start to fit together. Um, I'm sorry, every time I let go of my computer, I know you guys are rocking. Um, I won't sit in a rocking chair next time. Um, so yeah, absolutely. So scenes make it, to, and Suzanne taught me to write in scenes, um, makes it a little bit more manageable and it also makes it so you can move them around a little bit like a puzzle. 
Um, <clears throat> and think of scenes like the way that you would watch a TV show or a movie. Um, I always use Friends as an example because my son and I binge watch Friends together. Um, you know, they, when the six of them are in the coffee shop, you know, that's one scene. And then the six of them go up to Monica's apartment and that's another scene. So basically every time the camera angle changes like from one room to the next, or when they cut to commercial, when they come back, that's another scene. And so those are very, very short. I mean, if you think about it in a 30 minute sitcom, they're probably, you know, 22 minutes of actual show um, minus the commercials and, you know, seven scenes. So that's three minutes a scene. So they're very, very short and tight. Um, and tight writing is really the best writing, and it's what is what keeps the tension moving forward. So I highly recommend when you guys are writing to teach yourself how to write in scenes because it'll keep you focused and it'll give you a sense of accomplishment, um, which is huge. You know, we we need those little pats on the back sometimes, um, and it'll just help keep it'll help keep moving the whole story moving forward. Um, does that make sense? Scenes. Yes. Okay, so main want and need um, we talked about. If you guys have questions, let me know. Um, number three, I mean, I guess this could really be the six main, uh, you know, things of a novel um, because number three is very closely related to number two. And number three is the secondary wants and needs of the main character. So again, to reference my own work, and I'm not an egomaniac by any stretch, but it's just easier for me to talk about something that I'm very, very familiar with. Um, you know, Jenny, her main want and need is that she wants to make things right with her parents. She wants to come home. She needs to tell the truth, but that's, you know, that's hard. There are consequences that she hasn't even thought of. Her secondary wants and needs um, are, are a little bit smaller. Like I said, you know, she has this jerky husband and this lovely boyfriend that she left when she went to boarding school when she was 16. Um, you know, so that's a secondary need, wanting to figure out her marriage, that's a secondary one. Wanting to figure out what might happen with Ryder again, that's a secondary one. Um, Jenny used to play piano. She was uh, granted a scholarship to Juilliard and she gave that up when her brother died as a way of punishing herself. You know, why should she be off playing piano and being this piano, you know, concert pianist and having this great life when her brother's dead? Um, you know, so she gave up the piano. And so she gets back home and her parents still have the baby grand that's sitting in the middle of their living room. And she hasn't you know, gone near a piano in 16 or 13 years. Um, and it still has the same sheet music on it that she tried to play at her brother's funeral and couldn't. Um, you know, and every day she walks by it and it's like the piano is watching her. Um, you know, so that's, a, that's another secondary want and need for her. Um, so basically the whole point of doing the secondary wants and needs is to ramp up the tension. Um, I will talk about a, a lot about layering the characters. The more layers you can add to them, the more interesting they are. And like I said, you know, when we can relate to our characters, um, we become more invested in the story. We want our main characters to be good people. We want them to be people that we can that we can relate to and that we want to have sit, you know, we share beer with and you know put our feet up on the couch and you know chit chat with. Um, there are occasionally books like Gone Girl and Girl on the Train that have despicable main characters that are very, very successful. Um, good for them. They're very hard to write. I don't recommend it. Um, you know, so we do want our main characters to be good people. We do want them to be, you know, they're called heroes or heroines for reasons. Um, and one way that we make them good people and make them heroes is by making them interesting and people that we can relate to. So the secondary, I feel like, I always feel like I'm cheating people a little bit with number three because it really could just be like 2B. Um, but it's, it's the secondary wants and needs are very closely related to the primary ones. They're just kind of like the understudies. They're just, you know, one more way of making that character interesting. Um, does that make sense? Anyone have any questions about the primary and secondary wants and needs? Okay, number four is my favorite, um, mainly because it's like something I just like to say. Um, number four is the main character's poverty and flaws. Um, I mentioned that before. Um, uh, I would just hang on one second. I've got a question from Anne. Um, it says, it says, it seems like the second moves the plot and the third fleshes out the character. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, 
you know, all these things are making the plot more believable and making the plot move along and also developing the character as well. You know, they kind of go hand in hand. There are two different, you know, they're, they're character driven stories and then they're plot driven stories. And that holds true from, um, at least I'll get to you in a second. Um, that holds true for books and TV shows and movies. My books, like I said, are very character driven because I, I concentrate on the characters and their relationships and really dialogue. Dialogue is very hard to write. Um, so they do, they kind of go hand in hand. One pushes the plot forward, one pushes the character forward. Um, and you kind of need all them together. Um, okay, so number four, uh, a couple people have asked. I got off track again, sorry. Um, number four is the main character's poverty and flaws. And basically that just means that we want those characters to be human. And yes, they're the hero and yes, they're the protagonist. And yes, we want them to be our best friends and sit on our couch and drink wine and, you know, have a good conversation with. But part of the way that we make them real people is by making them flawed. Um, and the way that we do that is just by, you know, make them not perfect. Jenny, I think um, some of the negative feedback I got, and like I said, you know, everybody gets one star reviews. <laughs> um, part of the negative feedback I got about Jenny was that she was a little too self-involved and she was a little too like, you know, felt too sorry for herself. Um, and that was really what I tried to make um, have her be her poverty and flaw is that she was very damaged. I mean, this girl killed her brother. It was an accident, but she, she took a life. You know, she was responsible for this poor guy's death and her brother was her best friend. Um, and her brother's best friend, other best friend was her boyfriend, you know? So it was a very, very difficult loss for her. Um, you know, and so she, she did kind of fall into this like, you know, well of kind of being pathetic. Um, so that was her, her flaw. Um, I don't think I, it was my first novel. You know, I'm not the world's best writer. I will never be the world's best writer. Pat Conroy was the world's best writer. Um, you know, but so I don't think I developed that well enough. I think instead of seeing her as damaged, people saw her as a little bit whiny. Um, so I think in my second novel, I overcorrected a little bit and I made Katie very self-deprecating like her flaws were you know she was overweight and she not that that's a flaw I mean I'm not a supermodel but she thought it was a flaw um you know she was she hated her marriage she hated her fame she hated her life she hated her husband Katie hated a lot of things and I think really what happened with Katie is that she hated herself um, one, because, you know, why should she live when her sister didn't? Um, and two, because she couldn't save her sister. And three, because she couldn't figure out who in the world killed her sister. So flaws are really, I mean, it can be anything. It can be that they, you know, don't brush their hair or they forget to brush their teeth um, or they're selfish or they steal things. You know, it can really be anything. It's just, it's another way that we layer the character and make them real. And instead of, you know, adding to their angst or, you know, their wants and needs or how pretty they are, or how smart they are, or, you know, what a great, whatever they are, um, it, we, we focus a little bit on their negative things. Um, and that's just, you know, it's just one more, one more way of making them human. Um, does that make sense? Um, you know, and, it, and it's a hard thing to do. Um, it's a hard thing to do because it's a, it's a little bit of a fine line between making them not whiny, but flawed and making them, you know, have some, you still have to make them likable. But one of the ways that, I mean, you know, didn't we all know that perfect girl or that perfect boy in high school? They were just so damn perfect. And you're like, Ugh, I can't like you because you're just too perfect. And that's not, yes, it's petty, but you know, that's, it happens. Sorry, um, you know, and that's not what we want for a character. We don't want them to be, uh, yes, it is poverty. Um, it's not what we want for our characters is to have um, people think that they're too perfect, even though they're the hero. You know, not everybody has to be the, the beautiful cheerleader or the quarterback or, you know, the kid that has a 4.0. You know, they can be real people and have real problems. Um, and yes, I will, um, somebody asked if I could send an outline, um, because I know I'm doing a lot of talking here. I will send an outline of, um, these seven things, just so you guys have kind of a bare bones skeleton of, um, what I'm talking about here. Um, so poverty is in plus, see, now I'm getting ahead of myself. Now we still have 45 minutes left. <laughs> um, poverty is in plus. Does that make sense for everybody? Poverty? Poverty. Yeah. Like think of like being poor. 
Um, yeah, and I don't know if that's a, I write poverties and it comes up on my spell check as being misspelled. So I don't know if poverties is actually a real word. Um, but it's something that I picked up from Suzanne. Um, you know, she talks a lot about poverties and flaws um, in, uh, in our work together. Um, so yeah, poverties and flaws is really just a mouthful way of saying that you want to make your character real. Um, number five, and again, this is something that we've already talked about a little bit. Um, if you guys could hang on for me one second, I'm going to open the window behind me because it's like 9,000 degrees. Hang on. Sorry about that. Um, I'm in a room that I never go in to get away from my children. It's very hot in here. Um, okay, so number five is um, rising to the climax. And I've already talked a lot about this, so I'm not sure how much time we'll have to spend on it. Um, some, uh, Karen says maybe deficits. Yeah, we could do deficits, you know, deficits and flaws, but I really like poverties. It's a fun word for me to say. Um, but yeah, same thing, deficits, poverty, flaws, um, shortcomings, anything like that, you know, you, you can fill in the blank. Um, so number five is rising to the climax. And I've already talked about that a little bit, but I'll talk about it some more. And that's what I was talking about before when we write the, the, the scenes and how each one piles on top of each other and, you know, ramps up the tension a little bit more, a little bit more. You really want to think of rising to the climax as your arc. I mean, all books hopefully have an arc where it starts with the beginning of the story, you know, you get more into it, you learn more backstory. Backstory is very important. Um, you know, it's how we get to know the characters before they were um, who they are, you know, and it's how as readers we get to know what makes the characters who they are. Um, but it's also how we push the story forward until we get to the, you know, just past the middle of the arc when it starts to come down again. Um, that's like I keep saying, that's when the climax happens. Um, and so everything that we want to do, and this comes back to what I said in the beginning about how every scene, every character, every everything has to push the story forward because that's how we rise to the climax. And a really oversimplified way of knowing if your character or your scene or your chapter or your thread or your whatever you want to, you're working on at that moment, a really simplified way of knowing if, it, if that thing or person or thread pushes the story forward and makes it rise to the climax is to take it out um, temporarily. I will give you an example. When I was writing Night Blindness, I had two characters who I just adored both of them. Um, the, the main character, her name is Jenny. Her father's name was Sterling. Sterling's best friend, his name was Luke. Um, I have my kids name my characters in my towns and stuff. And my son, when I started writing Night Blindness was probably, I don't know, four or five. And, you know, all four and five year old little boys love Star Wars. So we named him Luke after Luke Skywalker. Um, now he's horrified by that. He's 16. Um, but anyway, so Luke was the father's best friend and he was very, he was a piano player also, which is why Jenny was a piano player. Um, and Luke was very spiritual. He wasn't a, you know, priest or a therapist or anything like that, but he was very like, you know, live and let live, you know, everyone can get along. He just, you know, he had a lot of inner peace. Um, and people went to him when they had problems because that was Luke. He was very chill. And then the mother, her name was Jamie. Um, Jamie had a priest that she did seek counsel in. Um, and his name was Patrick. And I loved Patrick. Patrick was like 30. He wore blue jeans. He smoked cigarettes. He had a Muddy Waters t-shirt. He was just, and part of good writing is surprising the reader. I mean, we all think of Catholic priests and we think of, you know, old guys and, you know, the collars and, you know, not having much of a life. But Patrick was the total opposite of that. He was young and hip and fun and a little bit naughty, but very, very committed to his religion and his faith. Um, but they both kind of served the same purpose. Patrick and, and Luke both were the people that other characters went to when they needed help. Um, and Suzanne said to me, sorry, but you know, this is a 300 page novel with six or seven main characters. You can't have two main characters with the same job, the same purpose. And I was like, but I love them. And I, truth be told, this is creepy, but I had a little tiny crush on Patrick, which is really bad because A, he was a Catholic priest and B, you know, he was imaginary. 
Um, but I did just love Patrick. Um, but I also loved Luke because Luke was actually a composite of somebody that I knew to steal a word from Wally Lamb. He was a composite of my father's best friend. So there's no way in the world I was getting rid of Luke because he was Clarence and I just loved Luke and Clarence. Um, so Suzanne said, you have to, and this was my first experience with killing your darlings. She said, you have to kill Luke. I mean, you have to kill Patrick and not like kill him off in the, in the book, but like actually just never have him be in the book. And I said, but I love Patrick. And she's like, that's too bad. You have to kill him. And I said, but no, you, the book can't know. And she said, do me a favor. She said, highlight, you know, all computers have that awesome little find button. She said, enter Patrick into the find thing. And every time his name comes up, just highlight that section and just read around it. Now, granted it was choppy, but you know, I pretty much got this, the feel for what the book would be like without Patrick. And sure enough, you know, Suzanne was right because Suzanne is a goddess and she's always right. I didn't need him. He didn't, you know, the book was just as strong, if not stronger without him, because she was right. You know, Patrick and Luke served the same purpose. So that's one way that you can do it. If you're writing your book and you feel like you might have something that doesn't add to the climax and doesn't build the tension reaching to the climax, um, you can highlight that name or that thread or that whatever it is and just read around it and if the book still makes sense without it then you know you don't need it um and the first time i killed my darling and that's a faulkner quote um or a faulkner tool i guess killing your darlings was really hard because you know as writers and this comes back to the way beginning of writers groups um that i think as writers we all feel like what we write is brilliant and perfect and we all need it and every little detail and every little character and every little everything has to stay in or the world will stop turning and the book won't make sense and then our readers will be disappointed and then we'll never be bestsellers which is all total crap because guess what if you take something out before the book is published, the reader never knows it's there. They never knew it was there to miss it. So it's hard um, getting rid of Patrick and Patrick, the name and kind of the, the essence of Patrick, I did bring back um, and put him in my second book. He was a detective in my second book. Um, and Pat was, is a dear friend um, who is a doctor, who's a neurosurgeon and helped me with a lot of the medical aspects of night blindness. Um, so that was my shout out to Pat. So I did have to bring that character back or at least the name back, which I did. Um, so the first time I killed my darling was very, very hard. Now I've gotten a little ruthless, um, a little sociopathic in my writing that, you know, the second I get tripped up, and this is a really good way to know if you should kill your darling or something you're, do, you're doing isn't working. If you're so tripped up in a scene of trying to position that character in the perfect way of, on the couch, or trying to, you know, make the scene so it's, you know, spooky or entertaining or funny, and it's just not happening, save yourself the trouble, just freaking kill it. Bye-bye, darling, you don't need it. And just keep writing. Um, it's also okay to just abandon it and write around it. You know, I, I did a workshop in Clinton last year and somebody said to me, I'm stuck on chapter 46. I can't get past chapter 46. I said, then skip it and go to 47. And he laughed. I'm like, no, I'm serious. Just skip it. It'll still be there when you're done, you know, and probably by the time you're done, then either you'll realize you don't need chapter 46 or whatever it was that was tripping you up will be resolved. Um, you know, and that's the beauty of writing the way that we write now and not having to write everything longhand is we have this power to cut and paste and copy and delete and, you know, come back to things. Um, so I feel like I have talked a lot already about building the tension um, and that's kind of what, you know, that's, that's what writing a novel is about, is about building the tension. Because if you don't, build the tension and build the tension and build the tension. Instead of having an arc, like a nice little rainbow, you can have a very flat, very short line, which is not gonna be entertaining at all for anybody to read. Um, does that all make sense? All right, sounds like it does. Okay, moving on. And this is one that I completely made up. So feel free to ignore it if you don't like it. Um, it's just something I do to keep myself entertained. Hang on. It's still so hot in this room. Um, uh, so number six, I call it the badass talents. Um, and again, it is just to make, um, it is just to make the character that much more interesting. If you can have them have something that 
doesn't necessarily have to do with their job, but just makes them a little bit more interesting. It just makes them more real. And I you know I've said this a thousand times already, but anything you can do to make your, your characters more relatable and make them more interesting is going to keep your readers attention because there's nothing worse than getting to a character, you know, 200 pages into a book and being like, who's Peter? Like, you know, it's easier. I don't like Kindles. I have one. I don't like it. It's easier with Kindles because then you can just enter Peter into the search engine and then it, you know, tells you who Peter is. Um, but, you know, there's nothing worse than reading a book and not remembering who a character is, especially if it's a main character. You know, you really want your main character to be memorable. So if you can give him or her something, you know, just interesting about themselves, it helps add to their layers and helps add to their backstory. Um, like I said already, Jenny was um, a pianist. And I didn't realize this when I was writing, but this is one of the beauties about writing a lot of drafts. And it's also one of the beauties about being a pantser is that I let the characters tell the story and then I don't even really realize what's happening until I go back and read. Um, I wish I were that clever to be aware of it and to really be in, in control of it, but I'm not. Um, so I made Jenny this piano, this pianist, and the reason why I did it is because sometimes I do write with music playing and I'm a huge Bruce Springsteen fan. And he has this one ballad called Racing in the Streets that reminds me of my dad. Um, and it's got this beautiful piano solo in it. And I was writing the scene and I was like, okay, Jenny, who are you? You know, what makes you you? And this song is playing in the background. And I was like, God, that's a beautiful piano. Um, and so then I made her a pianist because I like the song so much. Um, and then, like I said, you know, she hadn't played since her brother died and she tried to play at his funeral and she couldn't play the song and she comes home after 13 years and the sheet music still sitting on the piano and it's like it watches her and, you know, Luke is like, there's something wrong with you. You know, you're, you're not playing the piano. You used to play the piano. You're, there's something wrong. He's like, you're going to have to tell me. And so he was this huge factor in making Jenny come clean. And it's because she like her giveaway her tell that something wasn't right was the fact that she hadn't played the piano in so long and she used to live and die for the piano and so as i wrote this this thread of jenny and her piano and i didn't realize it until i came back and read you know the first draft all the way through um the piano almost became a character and i know that's like a weird thing to say because it's an inanimate object but it was such a huge part of jenny and it was such a huge part of her arc that the piano like almost had its own arc. And that to me, and I can take no credit for that. I mean, I know I wrote it, but I'm telling you, I can take no credit for that. Um, it was completely Jenny and Luke and the piano, um, you know, that they told me the story. And so in the end, and I just thought like, you know, I'd just have a couple of flashbacks of her playing the piano and that would be that. Um, but at the end, Jenny does have to go to another funeral and in an effort to wrap up in part her arc and definitely the arc of the piano. Um, I had her play the song at the second funeral that she couldn't play at her brother's funeral. And so that kind of ended the story for the piano. And it, it to me, I felt like it was a little bit beautiful, but again, I still feel like I can't take any, um, my son's here, hi Coop. Um, I feel like I can't take any um, credit for it. Um, so, <laughs> Somebody just said that it all comes from you. Please take the credit. <laughs> Thank you. That's very nice. But I'm telling you, it's all these people that live in my head. Um, you know, so uh, in my third book, um, Piper, she was a little bit of a survivalist um, in that she could, you know, was like very MacGyver. She could make a, you know, knife from, um, you know, twigs and duct tape. Um, and that's because her father was like that. And it was just, it was a very fun thing for me to write. I think it made Piper, who was very sad and felt very sorry for herself and was a little bit of a pill. Um, I felt like that survivalist character made her a little bit more interesting. And that came from um, when I was like 10, my grandfather was a great man, but he was a strange agent. Um, when I was like 10, he gave me a book called Survival, Evasion, and Escape for my birthday. <laughs> like just what every 10 year old girl wants. But I tell you what, I, I get lost in the woods. I know which berries to eat and which ones will kill me. So, you know, that's just like, you know, and it's just, it's just fun things that you can add that A, will make you entertained when you're writing and B, will entertain your readers and C, will make your characters more real. Um, and it, I'm telling you, it can be 
anything. It doesn't have to be something huge like, you know, playing the piano. And I know nothing about the piano. So I did spend a lot of time on Wikipedia, which is a terrible site, um, looking up stuff about pianos just so I could like get the lingo correct. Um, in my fifth book, um, the, her, this girl's, her name is Tatum. Uh, she's, she can tie knots. Like, you know, everybody can tie like a square knot, but like this girl could tie any knot. Um, and, you know, there are knots that nobody's ever heard of, sheep shanks and clove hitch and timber hitch and bolin. And, um, and the big joke in my family is that bolins are like the most useful knot in the world. It's, if you have to know how to tie a knot, really need to teach yourself how to tie a bolin knot. And I cannot tie one to save my soul. And so Tatum's great talent in life was tying knots, which you might think is completely stupid and incredibly irrelevant, which it is, but it added to her. Like we got to know this girl, like she was kind of like cool and she could do things that, you know, a lot of other girls can't do. Um, exactly. Like Katie makes croissants. Yes. Katie was, thank you. Oh, somebody's read my book. Thank you. Um, yes. Katie was a very good cook. Um, you know, so Tatum learned how to tie all these knots and she grew up in a place where it was relevant and that's, you know, that added to her backstory because of where she grew up. And I will tell you that I grew so attached to Tatum and her knot tying um, that I um, don't know if you guys can see this. Where is it? Where is it? That is a bowling knot tattooed on my wrist. <laughs> Still don't know how to tie one. But it's there. So if I guess if I ever need to tie one, I can just look at my diagram. Um, yeah, so the badass talent is just anything that the that the main character does. It can do something that you did as a kid. It can be something you do now. It can be, you know, an old record collection that they or they collect beanie babies or cabbage patch dolls or whatever. It's just one more thing that adds to the layer. And, and I know I've said this a thousand times and I can't really say it enough. You want your characters to be very complex and very layered um, because like I keep saying, the more the readers can relate to them, the, the better they will be, in, the more they'll be invested. And that's what you want. You know, we all are, I think our goals as novelists is to um, write the book that makes us skip, you know, cooking dinner for our children and makes us feel like we're about to pee in our pants because we just can't find a good place to put it down or, you know, makes us stay up all night when we have an early meeting the next day because we're just so enthralled, we have to keep reading. Um, I just read Daisy Jones in the Six for my book club and I read in a day because it was just so darn good, I couldn't put it down. Um, you know, so that's what we want to do. And the way that we write really engaging novels like that is by um, making our characters very layered and complex. Uh, does that make sense? All right, I will keep going then. All right, so look, check this out. We got 25 minutes and only one thing left, we're golden. Um, number seven is the timeline. And the timeline of the story is basically twofold. It can be both when the book takes place, like what decade or era or century, and also how long the book lasts. Um, it doesn't matter if a book takes place over a hundred years or a person's whole lifetime or a weekend. Um, Herman, I can't remember his last name, wrote a book called The Dinner and the book took place over the course of a dinner. You know, so the whole book was like three hours long. Obviously there was a lot of backstory, um, but so it doesn't matter how much time lapses in a book. We just need to know how much time ha has it been because that's one way that we kind of keep track of what's happening in the story is, well, has it been a week since she broke up with her boyfriend or has it been three months? Um, and you don't have to be so obvious as to say like, six days ago, she broke up with her boyfriend. Um, you can use nature and holidays as a really great way of, of flagging time. Um, like in Night Blindness, when Jenny, when the book opens, it's her birthday and she flies home from New Mexico, New Mexico to Connecticut. And the first thing she notices when she gets out of the cab is all the, fris the frisithia are in bloom. So, and we know she's in Connecticut. So the frisithia are in bloom. So we know it's like what, late May. Um, and then when the book closes, she has spent all this time in a hospital with her father and she's kind of been locked away and she walks outside and she notices that the leaves are changing. And then the book, you know, then there's a scene, whatever, and then the book closes. Um, so we know just from using nature that the book opened in spring, in May, and closed in you know, like September, 
September or October. Um, and then I also used like um, 4th of July and you know the, the terrible heat of August um, to kind of keep time of so when things happen, like the first big party that she had or the first big family gathering that she had when she was home was the 4th of July. So now we know it's been like a month and a half. Um, you know, and so you just kind of want to keep feeding little things like that in so the character can keep time. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, so the reader can keep time. And you can do that, like I said, with um, holidays, you know, they can be walking down the street and they can see, you know, Christmas lights through a window, or they can see a jack-o'-lantern jack on, um, you know, front steps or kids trick-or-treating, um, you know, or people out at the grocery store buying bags of stuffing and cranberries. Um, the first snowfall, the first time they, you know, leaves turn green. Um, so using nature and holidays is a great way to let the reader know how much time has passed. Um, and like I said, you know, I've read tons of books like The Prince of Tides, um, which is my favorite book ever by Pat Conroy. It takes place over a summer and he does a brilliant, brilliant job of making sure the reader knows exactly when it opens and exactly when it closes. Um, for him, it opened right as he, he was a teacher. Um, Tom Wingo, right when Tom got out of school and it closed, I think, right when he was going, or should have been going back to school, he got fired. Um, but it also spanned Tom's entire life. Um, and that was with the backstory and with the flashbacks, which is a great way to do it. You just want to always make sure that the reader knows exactly how much time has passed because it can be frustrating to be like, well, you know, have they been married for a year or has it been five years or three months? Um, you know, you just don't want to have to make the reader guess about things like that, because that's one way, any, anything that takes the reader out of the story, which is, you know, anything that makes them stop reading or makes them have to stop and think or flip back through the pages trying to, you know, figure out what's happening. Um, that's, that's called taking the reader, well, I call it taking the reader out of the story. Um, and it, it's just, you know, oh, I'm now trying to figure out how long it's been since this event happened. So now I'm going to flip back to the pages. Oh, now I've lost my place. Oh, now I guess I'll go cook dinner. Um, and then, oh, I go cook dinner and then I have to go deal with my children and then I forget about the book and then I never pick it up again. So you, you want your reader to stay as engaged as possible. Um, and then the other, the other part of um, the timeline is knowing when the book takes place. Um, Suzanne's book that I mentioned before, The Summer Fletcher Grill Loved Me, which is a total mouthful to say. Um, the, it takes place in, I think, 1985. And the only way that you know that it takes place in 1985, I think, is maybe a decal on um, one of the cars. And it has something to do with the elections. Um, and I use that, too, in Nowhere Girl, that when um, Jenny gets home, she walks into her parents' driveway and Luke is there and there's an Obama sticker on his, um, on his bumper and it's something about his inauguration. So now we know that it's spring of 2009. Um, so it can be things like that that are really, really simple. Um, you know, just music is a great way to do it. You know, if it's, uh, you know, the Rolling Stones first song, we know it's the 60s. If it's some, um, you know, boy band, we know it's probably the 90s. Um, you know, music is a great way to do it. Pop culture, um, you know, flipping through people magazines is a, would be a great way to give you um, context for, you know, just global events. 9-11, um, you know, it's been five years since the towers went down. You know, so we don't actually say it's 2006, but we know it's 2006. Um, my third book, Drive, like I said, uh, is based in 1989 which was really, really hard for me to write. I didn't know it was gonna be that hard to write a novel that wasn't set in present day. Um, and one of the reasons why it was hard to write is because, you know, in my other books, I'm like, oh, she got home and she got a text message from her boyfriend. Well, no, nope, no nope, cell phones. Oh, she, you know, in my uh, Piper in Drive was um, a journalist for a newspaper. Like, oh, she had to research the story. She went on, you know, she Googled it. Oh, no, she didn't, no computers. Um, you know, so I had to spend some time in my local library with the head of adult services getting reacquainted with microfiche and microfilm and like, you know, trying to pretend that it was 1989. And it was a great big pain in the butt. Um, but one of the ways that I, and I eventually did say something, the book goes from 89 into 90. And I did eventually say something in that 
about, um, you know, a great way to kick off the new decade of the 90s. So I did actually say it, but for the first like 50 or 70 pages, um, I had I had two clues and my um, editor, not Suzanne, but for my publishing house, him, um, his name is Joe. Joe said that it was too subtle. Um, I love music, so I think everybody loves music the way I do. And I used a, a John Cougar Mellencamp song that had come out in like the spring of 1989. And he's like, that's way too obscure. Nobody's gonna know, you know, what year it is because of that song. And so then I also used that quote, um, I think it was Dan Quayle that said, a mind is a terrible thing to lose. Um, <laughs> that also happened to happen in um, May of 2000, uh, May of 1989. <laughs> so that gave the reader a little bit like, you know, even if you didn't know exactly what year it was or exactly, you know, what month it was when he made that, you know, public fumble, you at least know, oh, Quayle was vice president. So like, you know, you know, you know, kind of what the um, era was. So, um, you know, just things like that. Um, there's another book that I read that is a beautiful, beautiful debut novel called um, Tell the Wolves I'm Home. Um, I actually have had some contact with that author, which is thrilling to me. I love it when famous people respond to my emails. Um, she's very nice. Um, but that book is about the AIDS epidemic and it never gave any idea of what year it was. And you, it takes about a hundred pages or 150 pages, it's been a long time since I read it, before you realize that the guy is sick with AIDS and that it's very clearly new AIDS and nobody knows, they don't even know what the disease is, but it's very clear that it's AIDS. And so then after understanding that it's this horrible disease and nobody knows what it is, then you know it's the beginning of the AIDS epidemic and you know it's like 1984, 1985. But I spent the first 100 or 150 pages reading this book being like, oh my God, you know, like freaking give me an idea. And it was very, very frustrating for me. It's a beautiful book and it's beautifully told and it's a beautiful story. So I kept reading, but it's small things like that. And it's things that you wouldn't necessarily think of, but small things like that can trip up the reader and can take the reader out of the story. Um, and it would have been, you know, very easy to be like, oh, and you know, she got home and Bon Jovi's new album was playing, you know, so we know it's probably the eighties. Um, you know, she eventually did do a very good job of describing exactly what year it was through using the AIDS epidemic. Um, it just took a little while. It took a little longer than I, you know, I would have liked the world according to Sue. Um, it took a little longer than I would have liked. Um, so those are just two more things. Um, very easy to add, very subtle. You can, you know, flowers, um, trees, temperature, uh, weather, things like that. Um, are you know subtle but really really good indicators of when um the book you know to, to help the reader keep time um nowhere girl opens with um katie like opening a valentine's day card and you're like oh it's such a commercial holiday um you know so then we know it's valentine's day and the same thing you know i used a lot of like leaves changing and flowers and you know stuff that but then you of course have to know like what's indigenous and you know what blooms when and things like that um but so that's that's the two phases of there are the two parts of um timeline anybody have any questions about that i know i've been talking for a while hi there i do have a question actually i'm christine hi christine hi um when you're you're writing and i know you know some people will get the subtle hints like i grew up in the 80s so know those the music from that generation and things so you, you want to be subtle enough that you're not hitting somebody over the head with it but are you like for a millennial they might not know the same music so how do you kind of bridge that um you bridge that and that's a really good question um you bridge that by doing exactly what i did when my editor was like dude you know and john cougar john mellencamp kind of went through an evolution of his name like for <gasps> cougar and then he was john cougar mellencamp and now he's just john mellencamp and so by the fact that i called him john cougar mellencamp I thought that that was enough, but my editor was like, dude, nobody but you knows that. Um, so that's when I added in the second part of, you know, Quail's boof. And all I did was I Googled, um, like, notable events in May 1989. And it gave me this whole list of things in the internet is a beautiful thing. I don't know how people wrote books before the internet. Um, <laughs> But it gave me this whole list of things that happened in 89. And so I chose one that I thought, A, would be probably memorable. You know, I don't really expect young adults to read my books. You know, I don't really expect 20-year-olds who weren't alive 
um, you know, when Dan Quayle or even know who Dan Quayle is, you know, so it's kind of what your audience is, you know, we all like to think that, oh, our target, target audience is, you know, men and women from ages 15 to 90. No, it's not. No, it's not. And, you know, don't ever go near a publishing company with that mentality of, oh, my book is going to appeal to everybody because guess what? A, it's not. And B, it's way too expensive to try to market a book to, I don't know, the world. Um, so you really have to know your audience, you know, and if I thought that it was a young adult, like um, Fletcher is kind of a young adult uh, novel. And so Suzanne's um, references, this, I think Fletcher came out in 97 and it was set in 85. So Suzanne did do a good job. She did a brilliant job of targeting people who A, were young adults and B, would know what was going on in that time. So, you know, you can use the more subtle hints like music or, you know, whatever, you know, subtle things might happen. And then you can also use the bigger ones, you know, things that everybody would know, even if they weren't alive. You know, if something happens in the 40s, you can refer to the Holocaust. You know, obviously, you know, none of us were alive then, but, you know, we all know what it is. Same thing with 9-11. You know, my kids, thank God, were not around then, but they know what it is. Um, you know, so you can, you can just use things, pop culture, um, that is big enough that everybody would know it. Does that make sense? It does. Thanks. Excellent. All right. Somebody wrote, um, Josie wrote, I am writing a middle grade novel and the story depends on not having modern conveniences like cell phones, social media, etc. Do you think it would be too irrelevant for middle graders, middle grade readers to base a story aimed to that age group in the 80s or 90s? Um, absolutely not. Um, and one of the reasons why I think it would work very, very well is because it's interesting. Um, you know, things that like my kids, you know, my kids love to make me feel old. And they're like, well, how, how, how did you tell grandma that you were out if you didn't have a cell phone? And I'm like, I don't know, there's this like old clunky thing that, you know, that Superman used called a payphone. <laughs> you know, I used to like put a quarter in my bra and call grandma when I got to where I was going. You know, So, and, and they look at me like I'm just either stupid or mystical. Um, so I do think that it would be interesting, um, you know, for middle graders, for kids of this era to read about something that they have no idea about, because it's interesting. It's not something that, you know, we spend a lot of time talking about 9-11. We spend a lot of time talking about the Holocaust. You know, we spend a lot of time talking about, you know, Desert Storm and those wars. We don't spend a lot of time talking about like, oh, well, when I was little, you know, I had to go to the library and use encyclopedias. And my kids are like, what the hell is an encyclopedia? Uh, you know, so I, I think it would work just fine because it would make it interesting. And the more important part of that is if it's a good story. You know, if it's a good story, your readers will forgive something that they can't quite connect to. But I don't think that that should stop you from writing a middle grade novel set in that era. Um, and there are lots of novels um, that are set in you know, middle grade or young adult that are set in that era that do very, very well. Um, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't let that scare you away, but I will tell you it's a little hard because it makes it harder to, to write things like, you know, well, how did she do her homework? You know, my kids live on their computers. They don't have textbooks anymore. Um, you know, so just to get that accuracy correct, um, you know, took some brain power, at least for me, um, took some brain power and took some um, research at the library to really remember what it was like to be 16 in the 80s with no computers. I mean, we didn't even have computers then, never mind the internet. Uh, anyone have any other questions? Nope, oh, nope, just, just said thanks. Anyone else? Um, okay, so I think this went well. Um, I will definitely get you guys, oh, thank you for the thumbs up, Anne. Um, I will definitely get you guys an outline. I don't know exactly how to do that. Um, you're very welcome, Karen. I'm having fun doing this stuff. It's been, it's been a little while since I've done this, um, at least since before, you know, the pandemic. Um, I will, what I'll probably do is email an outline to, um, Jenna and then she can get it to you guys. Um, I don't know how exactly she'll do that. I don't know if you guys signed up with emails or whatever. Uh, I can next week, I hope all of you will join me next week. Um, I can also just put it up on the screen or figure out a way to get it to you, but I will get it to you. Um, so like I said in the beginning, this is a three-part series. Um, first one was obviously what we did today. 
Third one is publishing options. And that goes more than just talking about um, self-publishing versus traditional publishing. It also has a lot to do with how to query agents. That's like <sighs> so hard. Um, you know, I found it much easier to write um, a 300 page novel than I did find it to write a 300 word summary for, you know, when I was querying agents. Also like what some of the benefits are, um, you know, what to expect. Um, you know, I really thought that I would be a little bit of a rock star and I realized when I got signed by, you know, one of the top five um, publishing houses in the country and I got a two book deal for a debut novel and it was a six figure advance and it was like all this amazing, wonderful stuff. I really found myself to still be a one man band doing like, you know, even though I had 26 people on my team between, you know, all the editing staff and then book design and book covers and media and um, what's where uh, publicist and marketing, I still found myself doing most of that stuff myself. Um, so, you know, like the less glamorous side of the business. Um, Lisa wrote, did you know much about the business side before finding yourself, uh, hang on, before finding yourself in it or learned it on the job, so to speak? Oh no, I knew nothing. I knew zero. I had zero idea, zero. And in a way I'm glad I didn't know because I think if I had known how hard it was going to be, I might not have done it. Um, it is so hard and I definitely learned as I went. Um, and I'm really glad that I had Suzanne because she, has been instrumental, you know, none of this would have happened without her. And also my agent is fabulous too. Um, you know, so that's some, that's another thing we'll talk about is not just going with the first agent who wants you, but going with the right agent who wants you. Um, you know, so that all that stuff will be the um, third one. The second one next week is a little bit of a mishmash. Um, when I do these events in person, um, I, I hope I'm giving you hope. <laughs> um, when I do these events in person, I always invite people to bring like, you know, one or two pages or maybe three pages if they want to read. Um, and I will offer that to you next week. And then we do positive, um, constructive feedback. Um, nobody has to read if they don't want to. There's never any pressure. It's never anything negative. Um, sometimes, like we were talking in the beginning, the writer's group, just hearing yourself saying it out loud and getting it um, out there can be helpful. I don't know if it's weird to do it, to read via Zoom. Um, so if you want to bring something next week to read, by all means, if you don't, that's cool too. Um, next week is a little bit of a mishmash. We'll talk more about the editing side and revising side some do's and don'ts, um, cliches is up there, narration versus dialogue. Dialogue is so hard to write. It's so hard to write because we all, not all of us, but most of us start out writing dialogue the way that we were taught to write, you know, in eighth grade English class. We use full sentences. We use a, you know, a verb and a noun and we don't end our sentences with prepositions. But when we're talking, that's, you know, in real life, that's not how it goes. You know, we, I, I'm lucky if I can get more than two word answers out of my children. Um, you know, so dialogue is very hard to write for that reason, because it's, it's hard to make it sound real. So I do spend um, a lot of time talking about narration versus dialogue. Um, and, you know, just stuff like that. So I hope that I will see you guys next week. Um, and if you want to bring something to read, by all means, please. Oh, I'll also talk about showing versus telling. Um, that's a huge thing in writing. I'm sure it's something that you've all heard of, but we'll talk about it anyway, because it's important. Um, so next week, if uh, same bat time, same bat channel, I promise I will not be in a rocking chair. Um, <laughs> give anybody seasickness. Um, so I hope to see you all next week. Is there any last questions or comments before we go? No, as always, it's good, Susan. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. Um, I really enjoy doing this. I know you guys have given up two hours on a, well, rainy um, afternoon of your summer. So I appreciate you being with me. Um, and you guys all have my cell phone and my email address. So if there's anything that comes up between now and then that you want to, a question that you forgot to ask, if you wake up in the middle of the night and you just you know want a clarification because I say things like, it's a secret. Oh, wait, nope, it's not a secret. Um, you know, by all means, uh, give me a call or email me and I will get back to you and I will you. see you all next thank week. You, thank, thank you. Thank you so much. It was really great. I appreciate you guys being here. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye guys. Bye. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye.